Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the gene cloning. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about how you can be able to fish out a gene from the genome. There are multiple methods or multiple approaches what we have discussed. So, we have discussed about how you can be able to prepare the genomic library how you can be able to prepare the cDNA library and how you can be able to use the different screening method to, to fish out a particular gene from the uh, particular gene library. Apart from that, we have also discussed about the polymerase chain reactions to, uh, to, uh, to amplify a particular gene from the genome. Uh, once you have amplified the genome, you can be able, once you get the amplified gene, you can be able to uh, digest this gene with the help of the uh, restriction enzyme and that will give you the cohesive ends and that these cohesive ends can facilitate the ligation of this uh, gene fragment into a uh, transforming agents such as vector. Once you have the recombinant DNA, you can actually be able to deliver that DNA into the host cells and then you can be able to use that for many downstream applications. Now, in this current chapter, we are actually going to discuss about the applications of the recombinant DNA technology. So, recombinant DNA technology as I said is going to be uh, utilized for uh, many types of applications. Uh, so, uh, in this particular chapter, we will discuss about the uh, some of the applications which are uh, you know you might be aware of and some of the applications which are very very important for understanding the complicated biology of an organism. So, what we said is that uh, you are once you have generated the suppose you have taken a gene right. And once you have generated a recombinant DNA, which means you are actually going to put this DNA into a vector, you are actually going to use this for multiple types of applications. You can be able to use this for protein production, you can be able to use this for understanding the different types of basic applications or basic questions related to science such as you can use this for asking the questions what will be the transcriptional activity of this particular construct and what would be the translation. Okay? So, you can actually be able to use this for understanding the basic questions. Apart from that, once you are actually going to use the, this for the protein production, the protein could be of multiple types. It could be the antibody, what you are, what you can be able to generate uh, or produce with the help of the recombinant DNA technology and this antibody can be used for uh, like for example, the for passive immunization. If you are not familiar with many of these techniques or many of these terminologies, probably you will understand once we will discuss each of these aspects. Uh, apart from that, these antibodies or these proteins can be a source for generating or making a vaccine, right? So, that also is going to discuss. This recombinant DNA directly can be used for uh, product uh, for generation of vaccine. Uh, just like as we have understood about the COVID vaccine, right? So, COVID vaccine is also a vaccine where you have directly taken into the this recombinant DNA and inserted that into the as, as a vaccine. So, when it goes inside, it produces the protein and that is how it is actually going to give you the protection against the COVID virus. Uh, apart from that, this uh, recombinant DNA can be used for many more applications. So, let us start discussing about these applications. So, the first application is the DNA fingerprinting. Now, what is mean by the DNA fingerprinting? Okay? If I ask you a similar question, what is mean by the uh, fingerprinting? Okay? Finger printing. Then you will say okay, very clearly if I put the 
So, finger painting means the pattern of pattern present on the finger, right? That is what it is says, right? Similarly, what could be the pattern present in a DNA sequence, right? You know that the DNA is composed of the four different types of nucleotides, right? Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, right? Now, these nucleotides actually can be arranged in a different types of combinations, right? You can have ATGC, you can have ATTTGC. So, all these can be combined in a multiple uh, orient, multiple random combinations, right? It could be uh, ATGC or it could be A, T, T, G, C, it could be A, G, 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 C, T, 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 A, A like that. So, these combinations could be very much varied, right. So, arrangement of these bases along the DNA strand is specific to a particular individual, right. So, just like as we are utilizing a fingerprint of an individual, right, remember that when you go for making an Aadhaar card, right. What, what they do is they are actually going to take your fingerprint because these fingerprints are specific for a particular individual, right. Similarly, can we have the similar kind of fingerprints of a DNA because that fingerprint of a DNA is also going to be specific for an individual. So, the human genome, now what you see is the human genome consists of 3.2 into 10 to the power 9 base pair. However, there is a very little uniqueness in the genetic makeup of the humans. About 99.9% .9 of the genome among human is the same and the remaining 0.1 consists of the site of a inherited variation. This means you have a very huge genome, but out of those huge genome 99.9% .9 genome is identical between the two individuals. Okay. So, it is only varying at 0.1 percent. In fact, it is low, le lesser than this value, but that 0.1 percent is also very, very, very big number. Okay. So, identifying these differences helps determine the re re relatedness between the two individuals. So, if I have two individuals, okay, I can be able to identify or I can relate them by looking at this 0.1 percent sequence that is present in one individual to another individual. Because if you are suppose you take the two twins right, if you take twins for example, now twins are going to be 100 percent identical right. You can have the uh, identical twins, you can have a Siamese twin, but majority of these twins are going to be 100 percent closer to each other, each other right. Similar to that, if you have two brothers, right, for example, right, if you have two brothers, right, brother 1 and brother 2, these two brothers are actually going to have 19.9 percent DNA constant because that is constant between all the individuals. Then within that 0.1 percent, which is also different between the two individuals, you will find that there are stretches which are common between the two individuals, okay. So, if you identify these differences, you can be able to say how closely these two individuals. One way of achieving this is by DNA sequencing. However, the sequencing and comparing the DNA of individual is very, very time consuming and it is not very visible because. So, one of the thing is you can actually have the flex, uh, flexibility of sequencing the whole genome of one individual, sequencing the whole genome of second individual and then you say okay, this is what the difference is this, this is what the, uh, this is the way they are uh, closer to each other. But that is very, very time consuming because sequencing and comparing the DNA of two individual will be time consuming, it is not cost effective and it is also not very, very much feasible in several of the occasions because given a time right, it is not possible. So, DNA fingerprinting was developed by a British geneticist uh, Sir Alex Zeffrey to alleviate these problems. How you are going to do that, okay? You are actually going to do that by identifying the patterns into the DNA, right? As I said, you know, DNA fingerprinting means pattern 
if you identify a pattern in a particular DNA sequence, you can be able to use that for uh, uh, for predicting how the two individual could be closer to each other or not. So, as I said, more than 90 percent of the human genome does not code for the protein. So, short sequences within the non-coding region of a individual genomes are repeated tandem at a locus which is called as BNTR and that is called as variable number tandem repeat. So, this is very important to understand right. You know that the human genome is 90 percent is non translatable right. It is not going to translate or transcribe into any protein ok. This means uh, this portion is uh, but at the same time it is actually going to have a short sequences with a non coding region and these sequences these non coding regions are repeating after every uh, some kilobase pairs ok. This means they are actually going to have a repeating units of these uh, tandem these the, these uh, short sequences and all these repeating units of short sequences are being called as VNTR or variable number of tandem repeats. So, you are going to have like for example, VNTR number 1, you are going to have 2, you are going to have 3. So, this is suppose you are going to have the individual number 1. This is going to be the individual number 2 where you are going to have first VNTR here, second VNTR here. And then in the individual number 3, you can actually be able to identify. So, the first VNTR would be present here, second here, third here, fourth here ok. So, now see the number and the arrangement of these repeat create a pattern which is unique to uh, every, everyone except the identical twins ok. So, this is this pattern is going to be uh, you know the the uh, unique right. For example, in this case you are actually going to have 1, 2 and 3, here you have either uh, only 2 VNTRs, here you have 4 VNTRs. So, here you have 3 VNTRs, here you have 2 VNTRs and here you have 4 VNTRs. So, they are varying in terms of numbers right and they are also varying in terms of the uh, location of these VNTRs. So, for example, here you have the VNTR which is present here right between this and these two arrows whereas, the VNTR is present between these two arrows in the case of the second and uh, so on right. So, location of these VNTR are also going to be different. So, the number and the location of VNTR is specific for a single individual and that can be uh, used to say how closer or how different the two individuals are right. Uh, VNTRs are further divided into the microsatellites. These are the repeat sequences of 1 to 9 base pair. So, rem remember that VNTRs are uh, small sequences is a small stretch of DNA, but it is longer in number right. It could be 100 and 200 base pair. Whereas, you can also you can actually further divide these VNTRs into a microsatellite ok. Because you can say that if suppose I have take two brothers right for example, right. So, if I have two brothers right brother number 1 and brother number 2. Now, when you take the brothers right they may not vary or they may not have the problem in terms of number of locations of VNTR between them. But they may actually vary in terms of the microsatellite or the mini satellite, which means within the VNTR also there could be a stretch which will be different between the two in two uh, brothers, right. It could be actually that in this uh, you have a microsatellite at this place and you, in this one you might have a microsatellite on this side. So, the and you it could possible that the microsatellite also may vary between the two brothers, ok. So, that is why the VNTRs are further divided into the microsatellite which is actually a repeat sequences of 1 to 9 base pair and the mini satellite which is a repeat sequence of 10 to 100 base pair. Each organism carries the two copy of these VNTR, one set is required from the mother and the other is from the father. And remember that uh, this is very very important information that you are actually going to keep collecting these VNTRs from the different individuals. So, when uh, there will be a fusion of the egg and the sperm, the VNTRs from the mother side and the VNTRs from the father side are going to come closer and they will be actually going to be 
present in the genome of an individual right and this is this is a very impo important information that can be used even for the those cases where you are actually going to have a dispute of the uh, multiple the uh, multiple uh, uh, possibilities right you can actually have a dispute about who will be the mother of this particular uh, son or who will be the father of this particular son for example you have the multiple fathers claiming for the same son along with the mother or you can actually have the so you can actually have the son uh, which will be having a vntr combination of mother and the father right now if you know the vntrs of the son if you know the vntrs of the mother you can be able to know the vntr of the father if you know the vntr of the father if you know the vntrs of the son you can be able to uh, know the vntr of the mother right and similarly if you know the vntr of the mother and the father you can be able to know the vntr of the son and that's why you can be able to use this information for identifying or sell uh, the particular uh, of springs and this kind of information is scientifically been uh, trusted by the dna fingerprinting and it can be used in the uh, in in the many of the criminal uh, cases or the uh, disputes where somebody is claiming that okay this is my son and somebody uh, other two couples are also claiming the same son as their son so in that case what people do is they just take out a small amount of blood and then with the help of the ntr analysis or the rfl uh, or the dna fingerprinting analysis you can be able to say very conclusively whether the son is having the vntr from the mother and the father or whether the so which couple is actually contributing into the vntr that information you will get very uh, precisely and that's how you can be able to solve these kind of family family disputes or uh, the inheritance disputes now the question comes how you can see the number of and the location of the vntr can, uh, can be done by two method one you can be able to do the sequencing of this dna or uh, and then only you will be know what is the location of the vntr in this particular sequence the but the sequencing as i said you know is is a time consuming it is uh, labor it is uh, you know it is uh, uh, money oriented right it's not cost effective and sometime you may not be it may not be feasible to perform so the other option is that you can actually be go ahead with the slightly more advanced technique and that advanced technique is called as rflp or restriction frag, uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms so what is rflp rflp is uh, the technique where which will allow you to identify the vntrs the simplest way to identify this vntr is the restriction fragment length polymorphism or the rflp conceptually the technique is a full proof method to identify these vntr practically observing every vntr in a gel in a gel is extremely uh, difficult so in rflp the unique patterns are generated for the genetic analysis and the identification after restriction enzyme digestion of an individual's dna in a specific region these unique patterns are generated due to the vntr that are genetically inherited thus the vntr may alter the restriction site and generate the unique pattern about the restriction digestions so what you do in this uh, rflp analysis is that you are going to take a dna right so you, what you are going to do is you are going to take a dna and then you are going to digest this with restriction enzyme so when you do digest this restriction enzyme it is actually going to generate the fragments now these fragments the size of these fragments will depends on the location of the restriction enzyme uh, on this particular uh, stretch of dna right suppose you this is the dna right and this location of the restriction enzyme will vary depending upon whether the vntr is present here or vntrs are present somewhere else so depending upon the presence and the location of the vntr the these uh, stretch of dna or the fragment what you are going to get could vary okay so this is what exactly it is actually going to do right for example if you have the two individuals right and you have taken out the dna 
So, decision enzyme site would be present here, here and here. Whereas, in the case of second individual, it is going to be present here. So, one is matching with one, but then the second uh, restriction site is missing and that is why you are going to have a restriction site that is the second restriction site which is. So, now if you if you analyze these uh, two DNA on a agarose gel, what will happen? It is actually going to give you the four fragments. So, first of all, it is going to give you the four fragments, right? Fragment 1, fragment 2, fragment 3 and fragment 4. So, this is going to be 1, 2, 3 and 4, okay? So, this is for the individual number 1, right? Similarly, for this one, you are going to get the three fragments. So, it is going to 1, you are going to 2 and it is going to give you the three fragments. So, 1 is going to give you 1, then it is going to give you 2, then it is going to give you the 3, right. So, it is going to give you 1, 2 and 3. This means the fragment number 3 is actually missing in the individual number 2, right, because there could be some mutations into the DNA or there could be some variation in the DNA sequence and because of that the person 2 actually lost this particular restriction site. Okay? So, it actually lost this restriction site and that is why the difference are different, differences are coming. This means the person 1 and 2 are not related to each other, they are of a distant relate, uh, relationships. So, here you can see that uh, due to the polymorphism one of the restriction site for person 2 has been removed. Thus, we can expect to see the different pattern in the case of person 1 and person 2 upon restriction digestion of these DNA fragments. So, RFLP is a very, very robust and acceptable scientifically acceptable technique to, uh, to match whether a particular individual is matching with other or not. Okay? Now, you can imagine that I can do the same kind of analysis for the mother, I can do the same analysis for the father and I can do the same analysis for the son also, right. And in this case what will happen is that if you do this, right, the mother's uh, fragments, father's fragment and the son fragment, okay. So, son will have the fragments which are present in the mother also, the son will have the fragment which is present in the father also. But the mother will have the unique set, right, it is going to have a unique set. Uh, the mother, uh, father is also going to have a unique set, right? But the father, the son will have the combination of the mother and the father, and that is how you can be able to do the same thing what we have just discussed for the DNA effect computing, okay? So, you can do the same thing with the RFLP, but in a much precision and much uh, specific way, and that is how you can be able to uh, handle many of these kind of. Uh, family disputes with the help of the RFLP. So, due to the labor intensive and difficult nature of RFLP, southern hybridization is performed using VNTR probe that allow us to visualize the variation of these VNTRs. So, remember that when we were discussing about the southern blotting, we said that the southern blotting is having the multiple types of applications. In that uh, southern blotting, we said that with the help of the southern blotting, you can be able to identify or you can be able to calculate the copy number. Similarly, with the help of if you make a VNTR probe, you can be able to uh, actually be able to probe the VNTR presence of the VNTR onto the DNA sequences and that is how you can be able to use that information for distinguishing the two individuals. Now, what are the steps involved into the DNA fragmentation, right, DNA fingerprinting? So, the first step is that DNA is isolated from the blood, hair, skin, semen, buccal, swab, etc. Uh, so, DNA can be uh, analyzed from anywhere, right. Then number two, the collected DNA sample is cut into the several fragments of the different sizes using one or more restriction enzymes. Then number three, the DNA fragments are then separated by the agarose gel electrophoresis. The DNA pieces of the different sizes are separated based on the size. Number 4, the separated DNA on the gel is thus transferred onto the nitrocellulose membrane. The nylon membrane is then exposed to UV radiation of a UV translator for the 3 minutes to or baked at minus 80 degrees Celsius uh, at 80 degrees Celsius for 2 hours to permanently attach the DNA 
onto the membrane. So, this step we have already discussed when we were discussing about the southern blotting. Then the southern hybridization is performed using the VNTR probe, the labeled stretch of the single standard DNA used to detect the presence of complementary target sequences. Finally, the hybridization DNA fragments are attached, detected. The pattern of the DNA bands are highly specific for each individual and can be used for the forensic and the paternity disputes. What are the applications of the DNA fingerprinting? So, the first and the very, very important application of the DNA fingerprinting is the forensic science. Okay? So, DNA fingerprinting is one of the most primary piece of evidence collected nowadays before accusing someone of any crime. VNTRs are used in DNA fingerprinting to match biological sample to the individual in crime investigation and paternity testing. And examples of such can be seen in the given figure. But right? so in the given figure, what you see here is that there is an example where the paternity test where the child exhibit a similar pattern of station fragment to the father 2 and the mother. This shows that the father 1 is not the actual father and the father 2 is the child's biological father in this example. So, what you see here is that you are actually going to have a single mother whereas, you have the two fathers which are claiming that they are the father of this particular child. right? Now, what we, will, we have to suppose to do is we have to suppose to isolate the DNA from all the individuals right? and then we are actually going to do the restation digestion. Now, what you are going to see here is that restation once you isolate the DNA and you will do restation digestion, you what we will see here is that the pattern of the child, this is the pattern what you are going to get for the child, this is the pattern what you are going to get for the mother. right? And this, these are the pattern which you are going to get for the father 1 and father 2. Now, if you see the pattern from the father 1, right? what you see here is that you are actually having the extra bands like this one. right? Then you have extra band which is like this one and then you also have an extra band which is this one. right? So, because see this band is maybe uh, present here. right? Whereas, what you see here is the father 2, father 2 this band is matching with this band, right? then this band is matching from this band, then you have this band right, which is present in the child and this is coming from this side. Right? You see this child is also having this band which is coming from the mother right? and then the this new child has uh, this band which is coming from the uh, this father. right? And then you also have a child has this band which is unique right? and then you also have another band which is also coming from the father number 2. So, majority of the band what are present in the father number 2 are actually present in the child and the majority of the band which is present in the mother are also present in the, uh, in the uh, child. This means this child actually belongs to the father 2 rather than the father 1 because many of the bands what are present in the father 1 does not be present in the uh, pattern of the child. Then the second point is you can actually be able to use the uh, DNA fingerprinting for the population genetics. So, VNDR helps the study uh, genetic diversity and the evolutionary relationship among the populations. So, um, there are many examples where you can actually be able to do the population genetics and it is actually going to help you to understand the migration pattern, how the people are migrating from the Africa to uh, the America or uh, Europe or India and how they were being distributed. Because as you are actually going for the more and more fertilization cycles, which means if suppose there is a mother and father, right? if they migrate to the new, suppose they have a offspring, right? so they have a son for example. right? If this son is going to migrate to another location right, and it is going to marry another woman. right? Now, once they will have the son, right, this son will actually going to have, so this guy will have a combination of these mother and father. right? So, for example, if I put like M1, F1, now this one is also M2. right? So, if the son is ma mating with M2, then this one which is S1, this is S2. right? The S2 will have the combination of S1 and M2, right? And that's how you will see that the, there will be a variation of the DNA 
starting from this right and suppose this sun is again migrating and going somewhere else and all this so these kind of migration will actually going to keep bringing the genetic or the variation into the vntr pattern and that's how you can be able to correlate how the vntrs are being distributed among the two individuals and that's how, how you can be able to make out how they will be related to each other then number 3 you can actually be able to use the dna fingerprinting into the medical research so some vntrs are associated with the certain genetic disorders making them useful in the genetic diagnostics and the research the number 4 you can actually be able to use for vntr in the id proofs so nowadays in addition to the social security numbers picture ids and other more routine methods the dna profile that is the vntr of an individual has been proposed to be used as a sort of genetic barcode for the personal identification so remember that uh, in the past we were always using the fingerprinting right so you are we are still using the fingerprinting for unlocking our mobiles and all that but in the case of uh, if you if somebody wants to identify you the dna is something which they can actually be able to use right and not only dna they can actually be able to use the rflp pattern right because that is going to be even more specific than the dna right so if you have the if they have information about the rflp pattern of the xyz right uh, they will be able to say that okay and if was suppose they got a dna at the criminal site they can be able to use that and identify the particular individual then the second uh, application is the generation of the transgenic organisms right so with the help of the recombinant dna technology you can be able to generate the transgenic organisms so transgenic organisms are the living organism genetically modified to carry the genes from the two species these have been produced by introducing the new gene segment through the transgenesis and not naturally found into the environment the process of insertion of a foreign gene that is a transgene into an organism's genome and its transmission and expression in the organism progeny is termed as the transgenesis transgenesis is a process to, by in which first you are going to generate the recombinant dna and then you are actually going to insert that into a uh, into a organism and then you allow that the integration of this particular gene into the uh, into the genome of that particular organism the transgene can come from the plants animals bacteria and the viruses and depending upon that they are actually going to exhibit their specific uh, uh, phenotypes the organisms carry a transgene is known as the transgenic organism or the genetically modified organism or the gmos the two widely used gmos we use daily are the transgenic plants and the transgenic animals so uh, this is a historical uh, understanding about the transgenic and uh, organisms the history of the genetically modified organism is a fascinating discovery that spans several decades so this is what it is given in your textbooks right uh, for thousands of year uh, people have practiced selective breeding this allows the people to have the desirable traits in their specific product the discoveries of the mendel watson crick's polberg and several other scientists have paved the way for modern biology and its application as we know today the first genetically modified organism was a bacteria by the herbert boyer and the stanley cohen in 1973 from then the onwards a race to create the genetically modified organism both the plants and the animals have kept up the pace beyond the imaginations so it is started very long back in the in the in the uh, you know in the ancient time that you are actually cross breeding the two uh, two cows right or two buffaloes one is uh, more sturdy in terms of re, you know resistant for the disease the other is actually resistant in in producing the different types of um, milk actually so you can actually be so when in the uh, when, when the if they were having the selective breeding what they are doing is they are taking the for example you have the two uh, uh, animals so one is producing the milk the other one is the disease uh, free right now when they are actually going to cross breed 
they are actually going to get a organism which is going to have the milk producing plus disease free and that is how they are actually keep improving their quality of the organisms. But this was not always uh, possible that they so this in this kind of uh, uh, you know the kind of ge genetic mo modifications were not under the complete control of the individual and that is why people have come up with the idea of generating a transgene then integrating that transgene into the organism and so on and that is how they have started producing the different types of the, uh, the genetically modified uh, crops. And you will see uh, the you know the there are so many uh, advancement in terms of the all these procedures like where you the DNA delivery methods or generation of the transgenes and all that so, and that is how the we have now a lot of transgenic uh, organisms especially the transgenic plants and transgenic animals which will take in care of the different types of the problems. So, in the in the year of 1973, if you see the historical development of this, uh, you will see that the first recombinant DNA molecule, the, uh, the scientist Herbert Boyer and the Stanley Cohen created the first recombinant DNA molecule by inserting a gene from the bacteria into another. This fundamentally experiment demonstrated the possibility of combining the DNA from the different organisms. Then year of 1980, the first genetically modified mouse was produced. So, John Gordon and Frank Rudel created the first transgenic mouse by injecting the foreign DNA into the mouse embryo. This, is, this will pave the way for creating the transgenic animals for the research and the medical purposes. Then year of 1982, the first genetically produced uh, product which came. So, approval of the human insulin uh, produced by the genetically modified bacteria by the FDA and this was a very, very significant uh, 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 step because it allows that it demonstrated the practical and the commercial application of the genetic injury in the medicines. Then in the year of 1983, the first transgenic plant was discovered. So, the scientists created the first genetically modified plant by introducing an antibiotic resistance gene into the tobacco and what is the significance? This opened the door for agri agriculture, biotechnology and the development of transgenic crops. Then year of 1994, the first genetically modified crop is approved. So, in the FDA approved the flavor severe tomato, the first genetically modified food. And what is the significance? It marked the beginning of genetically modified food entering into the consumer market. Then year of 1996, there will be an introduction of a Bt crop. So, commercially release of a Bt cotton and Bt corn engineered to produce a bacterial toxin harmful to the specialized insect pests. What is the significance? Significantly impacting the agricultural practices by reducing the need for the chemical fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Then year 1997, the first clonal animal event. So, birth of the dolly, the sheep, the first mammal cloned from an adult somatic cell by the scientists at the Roslin Institute in Scotland and it highlights the potential of genetic engineering and the clonal technology. The in year of 2000, there will be completion of the human genome projects and it actually unrevealed the many secrets of the human genome or human uh, diversity. So, it provided a comprehensive understanding of the human genetics adding into the identifying the gene for the genetic engineering. Then year 2012, there will be a CRISPR-Cas9 editing technology that development of the CRISPR-Cas9 technique for the precise gene editing by the Jennifer and uh, what is the significance? It revolutionized the genetic engineering by allowing for the precise and the relatively straightforward modification of the genes. And what is the present status? Present status is the, uh, there will be ongoing development. So, continuous advancement in the genetic engineering technology including the gene uh, drives, synthetic biology and the advanced CRISPR cas applications and it has a enormous potential where you are actually going to use these transgenic organisms. 
So, let us discuss some of these transgenic organisms. So, the first is you have the transgenic plants. So, transgenic plants are created using the recombinant DNA by the inserting the foreign gene into the plant genome. These genes can come from the other plants, animals, bacteria or viruses introduced to give the plant the new traits or the characteristic. The key characteristic that can be introduced are enhanced resistance, herbicide tolerance, improved nutritional content, enhanced growth yield and the environmental benefits. The basic requirement for genetic transformation is constructing a vector carrying a gene of interest flanked by the necessary regulatory sequences like the promoter or the terminator. The two most widely used technique for the gene transfer are the vector mediated transfer or the direct gene transfer. So, vector mediated transfer where you are actually going to use the agrobatium tumor CCS and direct gene transfer where you are actually going to use the ballistic gun. So, vector mediated transfer which is going to be bacteria mediated right, so, uh, bactofactin for example right. So, vector mediated or the indirect gene transfer where you are actually going to use the agrobacterium tumefaciens. So, agrobacterium tumefaciens is a rod shaped gram negative soil bacteria that naturally infects plant causing the crown gall disease. It contains a plasmid which is called as TI plasmid or the tumor inducing plasmid. For this reason, it is called as natural genetic engineering. It is commonly used for the transferring genes in the dicotyledon uh, plants. So, this is the, uh, the vector map of the, uh, the TI plasmids, right, where you are actually going to have the transfer DNA, you are going to have the uh, left border and right border and what you are going to do is you are going to insert your, so there will be a RFL, there will be a MCS and utilizing this you can be able to insert your uh, into the gene into this particular uh, vector and then you are actually going to insert this into the agrobacterium tumefaciens and then the you allow the infection of the agrobacterium tumefaciens to the plant. So, the bacteria is used to insert the tDNA carrying the foreign gene into the chromosome of a plant cells and that is how it is actually going to integrate this particular fragment into the plant and then the plant cells are grown in culture. The culture of plant cells with antibiotic containing media and the plant is generated from a cell clone. All of the it is carry, it will carry the foreign gene and have may express it as a new trait. Then we have the vector mediated or the indirect gene transfer. So, the TI plasmid is a large circular DNA molecule in the agrobacterium tumefaciens. It has several key regions. To, so, it has the tDNA, it has the vir genes, it has the origin of replications and then it also has the opine catabolism genes. So, tDNA is a region, this region is transferred to the human genome uh, into the plant genome and contains the gene encoding the phytohormones such as auxin and cytokine cyanin. These hormones may help to induce tumor in the plant. In genetic engineering, the tumor causing genes are replaced with the gene of interest. These genes are essential, so where genes are essential for transferring the tDNA into the plant cells, they encode the plant uh, protein that uh, process and transport the tDNA. Then we have the origin of replications, uh, the plant, uh, the plasmid can replicate independently within the bacterial cell. And then we also have the opine catabolism genes that enable the bacteria to utilize the opine produced by the transformed plant cells. To use the TI plasmid as a vector, the tumor inducing TI genes are removed and the gene of interest is included. This process is known as disarming. As antibiotic, this gene is also included in the plasmid as a selection marker. The vector containing the modified T gene that is the, the gene which contains the recombinant disarmed T DNA are transferred into the agrobacterium uh, tumefaciens. These agrobacterium cells carrying the disarmed TI plasmids are incubated with the leaf segment. The subsequent agrobacterium infection causes the tDNA to get transferred into the plant cell and the integration of tDNA carrying the target genes occurs in the plant in nuclear DNA. The transfected plant cells are 
grown in regeneration media supplemented with the bacteriostatic agent and the needle dose of antibiotic to stop the growth of agrobacterium and the selection of the transfected cell. Then in the step uh, in a few weeks the transformed tissue form the shoots which are transferred onto the rooting media where the transformed shoot make the root within the 2 to 3 weeks. Plantlets are then transferred into the soil and the molecular technique like the PCR are used to confirm the integration of the genome interest into the genome of these plants. Then we have the vector mediated or the indirect gene transfer. So, you plant virus mediated transfer. So, transgenic plant can also be produced by transfecting the plant cells with a modified viral vector. The most common vectors are tomato mosaic virus cauliflower mosaic virus and the potato virus. The virus of the chosen uh, based on the plant it can infect and the case of uh, ease of handling the virus. Plant viruses such as cauliflower virus can enter the intact plant cell and introduce their DNA into the plant's DNA. Use of plant viruses constitute another method to transfer the gene of interest into the plant cells. However, this is not a common method of plant transformation as compared to the agrobatium tuberosum. And then we have a direct gene transfer. So, direct gene transfer where you are actually going to do the uh, ballistic gun. So, particle bombardment gene transfer. It is a popular technique that can transfer the gene directly into the monocot or the dicot plants. It is also known as the ballistic gun and it is advantageous it, it allows the insertion of the multiple genes into the same cell. Uh, the gene of interest and the selectable markers are precipitated onto the microparticle using the calcium chloride or the spermidine. These microparticles are generally gold or, tung or the tungsten particles of diameter 1 to 3 micrometer in size. So, what you are going to do is you are going to uh, you know uh, you are going to put the chamber or you are going to put the sample into the chamber right and then you are going to have the DNA coated onto these gold particles and then you are actually going to bombardment these particles and the DNA coated gold particles are propelled towards the screen and into the target cells and then they will actually randomly going to insert into the DNA and then there are chances that some of the DNA particles or some of these gold particle will directly enter into the nucleus and that is how they will integrate or they will release their DNA content into the nucleus and that is how they are actually going to be uh, transferred. The micro projectiles are accelerated using a particle gun or the gene gun. So, this is the gene gun right. The gene gun uses the high pressure helium gas to accelerate these particles. The micro projectile projectiles accelerated to a high velocity are bombardment onto a selected cell. So, these are the selected cells which you are keeping it into the patty dish. The inserted DNA then integrated into the plant genome and produce the stably expressing cells. These cells are cultured in a nutrient media which allows the callus formation. The transgenic plants are generated using this callus and regrow into a uh, transgenic uh, plants. So, protoplast transformation and the electroporation. So, protoplast are naked cells. So, protoplast if you know that the plant is having a cell wall right. So, it has a thick cell wall right and then within this you are actually going to have a plasma membrane right. This, so, this is the plasma membrane right and within this you are going to have a nucleus and all other things. So, if you do something and if you get rid of this right, if you get rid of the uh, cell wall then you are actually going to generate a cell which is being called as the protoplasm or protoplast, protoplast actually which actually contains the nucleus. So, the plant cell without the cell wall is called as protoplast. This naked cell can take up the DNA from the surrounding and therefore are used in the transfection. Additionally, these cells have the ability to integrate the exogenous DNA into the genome and stably express them. The protoplast are produced from suitable tissue cultures, tissues such as uh, leaf tissues callus and the mesophyll tissues. These tissues are initially treated with the cell wall degrading enzyme like the pectinase or the cellulase right. So, your the protoplasts just form are then purified using a nylon wash and then diffused in a solution that maintain the osmotic balance of the cell. 
this protoplast can be transferred using the electroporation and the pack treatment. The plants are then converted into the transgenic plants using these protoplast by calling the formation and regeneration using the different cell culture technique. So, what you do actually is you are actually going to take the cell right plant cell you are going to do a treatment so that the cell wall is actually going to be get rid of okay and that is how you are actually going to generate the protoplasm right. So, you are going to treat these cells with the cell wall degrading enzyme like the cellulases, pectinases and lignases right depending upon the composition of the cell wall and that is how you are going to have the protoplasm and then the protoplasm is uh, really readily going to take up the DNA and that is how it, this DNA will enter and it is going to integrate into the genome of the plants. About the, uh, uh, the we have discussed about the application of the recombinant DNA technology, we have discussed about the, uh, the DNA fingerprinting, we have discussed about the RFLP and very briefly we have also discussed about the transgenic organisms. Within the transgenic organisms so far we have discussed about the transgenic uh, plants. Now, in our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the transgenic animals and we are also going to discuss some more aspects of the uh, related to the application of the recombinant DNA technology. Thank you.